Hello and welcome to Charity Chat, the ACNC's podcast. In this episode, we're going to look at the ACNC's Compliance Directorate. We'll have a look at the powers that the ACNC has to look into charities and investigate. We'll look at what the ACNC can and can't do. And we'll also touch on the approach that the ACNC takes to compliance with charities. My name is Matt Crichton and I'm from the education team here at the ACNC. And joining me to discuss compliance is the director of the Compliance Directorate, Prue Monument. Hello, Prue. Hi. Hi, everybody. Can you give us an overview of the role of the ACNC's Compliance Directorate? That word itself sounds like it might be scary to some people. (laughs) Is that the case? No, absolutely not. There's uh, no need to be concerned about the Compliance Directorate. Uh, Look, our role, um, the ACNC Act has a number of key objects and one of those is to maintain trust and confidence in the sector. And that's where the Compliance Directorate plays a really important role. Um, We identify charities that may be at higher risk of non-compliance and we investigate and address non-compliance. And look, in most cases that involves us working together with the charity to correct any uh, issues or, or concerns and get the charity back on track. Uh, Another important role that we play in the Compliance Directorate is that more broadly we monitor trends, issues and emerging risks and we advise the ACNC but also the sector more broadly about how they can manage and address those risks. We also, through our compliance work, we engage with a number of different charities and we get a lot of insight into the types of challenges or issues that charities are facing and we feed that information back into um, our education and public affairs team so that they can get the right type of targeted education and guidance out to the sector to support charities to um, correct any issues or protect themselves from fraud or or, um, criminality. Um, We also play an important role with the whole of government, across the whole of government. We share our experience and and concerns with state and territory based regulators, law enforcement agencies and also intel agencies. Um, And that's particularly in the terrorism financing and money laundering space um, where we need to work together with other agencies to address more serious concerns. Right. And just broadly, how does the ACNC identify concerns? You mentioned their terrorism financing and working with other agencies, both state and federal. Is it generally a collaborative act? Um, Look, we identify concerns in a variety of ways. Most concerns actually come to us from the public or from someone within the charity. Oh, okay, right. Uh, That's the vast majority of of concerns that come to us. But we also do receive referrals from other government agencies, law enforcement or intelligence partners, um, and we'll work with them to, to address those concerns. But increasingly, we're also using our own intelligence holdings and intelligence holdings of other agencies to address uh, high risk concerns. So we have a lot of information through our annual information statements that can help us identify anomalies or issues that we may need to look into further. Other government agencies also hold information that can provide a lot of value and insight for our own work and and where we need to target our compliance resources. Um, We also receive a small number of concerns through the media and other open source materials. And this would cover a range of concerns from the minuscule right up to the very serious. Presumably the ACNC can't look into absolutely everything that's raised with the Compliance Directorate. Where does the ACNC's powers lie? What, What types of concerns can the ACNC look into? Yeah, that's right. We can't look into absolutely everything. We can only accept concerns in relation to charities that are registered with the ACNC and where there's an alleged breach of the ACNC Act or regulations. Okay. Um, So this would include uh, non-compliance with ongoing obligations such as good record keeping, um, making sure charities are are carrying out their charitable purpose and providing accurate information such as the financial information or information relating to the charity's responsible persons. Most of the concerns we we get tend to relate to potential breaches of the ACNC governance standards and this includes things like using funds or assets for non-charitable purposes so where someone may be 
be deriving a private benefit from right. charitable funds or there may be some fraud or criminal activity going on in the charity. Other things include not being accountable or transparent to members or failing to ensure that responsible persons are suitable and, and not disqualified. There's also responsible persons have a number of duties to act in good faith with with due care and diligence and to act in the charity's best interest. And so from time to time, we will get concerns um, from the community or people within the charity where they feel there's been some failures in that respect. And another common issue that we see uh, is a failure to ensure responsible people have complied with the duty to disclose perceived or actual uh, conflicts of interest oh, okay. right. and not to misuse their position or any information that they uh, have in performing their duties. And th- that conflict of interest often crosses over with um, a perceived private benefit as right. well, or perceived yep. or actual private benefit. So that does cover quite a range and, and some of those are quite broad so you can see how many concerns would, would fit into say the ACNC governance standards or certain parts of the ACNC Act or regulations. But what would be some areas that the ACNC does not have responsibility for and, and really can't look into? Okay, so we wouldn't look into issues that were outside the jurisdiction of the ACNC okay. or outside of our Act and regulation. Yep. So these include things such as fundraising, uh, where there may be in an internal dispute within the charity, contracts a charity has with other organisations or individuals, or the quality of service that a charity provides. So, so Matt, while these things are generally outside of our jurisdiction, from time to time we will see a slight crossover. So, for example, how a charity conducts its fundraising, there's obviously still that responsibility of the charity to act with due care and diligence and to act in the best interests of the charity. And so from time to time we may look at it within that context. And also contracts a charity has with other organisations or individuals. Again, there'll be some crossover there with conflicts of interest, yeah. um, related party transactions, etc. So while generally um, everything else operating as it should, these things wouldn't fall within our compliance remit. But from time to time, there may be some slight crossover. Right, right. How does the ACNC approach compliance when it is regulating charities? So even though there are some things that the ACNC can't do and there are clearly powers with which the ACNC can act, what's the approach that the ACNC takes? Is it hard hitting and heavy handed? Uh, No, we're far from hard-hitting and heavy-handed. Look, we know that the majority of charities are doing the right thing or trying to do the right thing. Um, And so we always start from the premise that that charities are doing the right thing. We focus on helping charities meet their obligation through guidance, education and support where appropriate. And we collaborate with the charity to address concerns and get the charity back on track. However, having said that, where we do identify persistent non-compliance, gross negligence, really serious concerns, we will act firmly and swiftly uh, and take action against the charity to address the non-compliance. Um, we really have a risk-based approach to ensure our compliance resources are focused on the areas of greatest risk. So right. we talked a bit about the, the types of concerns we get and we get a high volume of concerns and it's not possible for the ACNC to to use compliance resources for absolutely every one of those concerns. So we have to think strategically about how we want to use our compliance resources to target the areas of greatest risk. Uh, The areas of greatest risk are also those that we think present the greatest risk to trust and confidence in the sector. So we published a compliance report at the start of 2017 Mm -hmm. and that outlined our uh, priority risk issues and we've got five so the first one is fraud and financial mismanagement and that includes things like private benefit fraud corruption tax avoidance the second one is uh, terrorism now that includes things like terrorism financing but it also includes charities that may be engaging um, in promoting extremist views right Harm to beneficiaries is another key area that we focus on and that's in particular children and vulnerable adults and where they may be at risk. 
Political activities, we're very interested um, in looking at organisations that, that may be at risk of having a disqualifying purpose, such as okay. promoting or opposing political candidate for office. The fifth one is accuracy and transparency of the charity register. And look, that's really important. Um, we want to maintain an up-to-date and accurate uh, register and so we do a lot of work to ensure charities are lodging their AIS and their financial reports on time and in 2017 uh, we started to issue financial penalties to charities that um, were failing to lodge their annual information statements and, and financial reports um, which indicates the, the value that we, we place on timely reporting. Right, you mentioned Penalties, that would be one power then. Mm -hmm. What are some of the others that the ACNC has to call upon when um, approaching its compliance activity? So the ACNC Compliance Director has a range of statutory powers it can use to protect charitable assets and beneficiaries. We have information gathering powers, so we have um, formal powers that allow us to request information or documents, not only from charities themselves, but also from third parties. So, okay. for example, we may request information from the charity's banks yeah, right. or other related parties to assist with investigations. We also have monitoring powers, and this is where we're looking at serious contraventions or non-compliance and we may need to gain access to a charity's premises. Okay. So there's two ways that we may use those monitoring powers. We can seek voluntary access to a charity's mm -hmm. premises, um, seek their agreement for us to, to come in and, and meet with them or to search the premises. Or if uh, we can't get the consent of the charity, we can request a formal monitoring warrant oh, okay, right. yep. that allows us access to the charity and the mm -hmm. charity's records to collect the information we need. We also have a number of enforcement powers, such as issuing formal warnings or directions to a charity to do certain things or make certain changes to okay, address yep. non-compliance or potential non-compliance. Um, we can also uh, make arrangements or go into formal agreements of sorts with a charity, setting out what changes they need to make to meet their obligations moving forward, and we'll then monitor that over an agreed period of time. These are called an undertaking, and it can be a voluntary undertaking or it can be an enforceable undertaking. An enforceable undertaking can actually be enforced through the courts if okay. required. Yeah, right. We have injunctions where we, the ACNC, can ask a court to make charities do or not do something on our behalf. We can disqualify, suspend or remove responsible persons such as a board or a committee okay, member. Yep. We can also apply financial penalties uh, if a charity fails to lodge their AIS on time or if they provide us with any false or misleading information. And in the most uh, extreme cases, we can revoke a charity's registration, which would mean that they're no longer entitled to access tax concessions. So there's quite a bit there. And you mentioned earlier on that the approach of the ACNC is, is more about collaboration with a charity and, and education and guidance in helping them help themselves through any troubles or issues. Do you get the sense that that's a pretty successful approach with charities? Look, I think it's I think it's quite a successful approach because, as I mentioned earlier, the vast majority of charities are trying to do the right, right. thing. Yeah. And so often what we find when we open an investigation is that perhaps the problems were caused by one person within the charity and, and that person has subsequently left and some oh, okay. issues yeah. have been uncovered, but everyone else in the charity is, is working to get the charity back on track. Or the failure occurred just due to a lack of understanding or um, capability to yeah. to keep the charity compliant. So yes, we will assist the charity with regulatory advice and guidance and get them back on track where possible. Uh, however, where there is serious non-compliance, fraud or misconduct, um, and the charity is not willing to engage with us to correct those issues, then we will tend to use um, more serious powers such as revocation. Right. That's all the time we have for today. Thanks very much, Prue. You've really given us a great overview of the ACNC's compliance role, and I think it gives people a valuable insight into the type of issues that the ACNC can look into 
and the powers that it has to act. Thanks again for your time, Prue. We really appreciate it. No problem. Thank you. Check out other episodes of Charity Chat and other free resources, including guides, fact sheets and webinars on our website at acnc.gov.au.